a red light or <laughs> green light. <laughs> red light. Red, red light. light. Why does she got such long hair? I don't know. Nope, it still has to be moving. You're gonna die right here. Oh uh, yeah, I think I'm dead. You're. F <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was gonna say anyway. I'm pretty sure it has to be moving in a rhythm. Here we go again with number three. Top three photos with disturbing backstories. Uh, part three in his uh, series, which I think he's up to 20 now, which I don't mind following through with this series because this series has been just freaking crazy. Uh, some of these, some of the photos that they've shown have just been like, what? Like, like the lead up to them has just been like, oh God, what's this going to look like? What's this going to look? And then some of them defy your, ex some of them meet your expectations and some of them defy your expectations. Like the Mount St. Helens one. Dude, the fact that this guy knew he was done, he was like no chance in hell of him ever escaping. And he decided to save the, you know, do what he could to save the photos. That's, that is like terrifying to me. I, I couldn't imagine being in the midst of that. This is the kind of thing that I think, uh, really plays into people's fears and how they differ and they're so unique from one another. Mm -hmm. Which is weird because the point of fear is supposed to be a genetically encoded survival instinct and yet everyone is scared of such different things. Well, I think... It really think... makes me wonder about that whole past life thing and how you might have died in a past life. Like, I swear I was like a pirate that was thrown to sharks or some shit. Well, I think we're instinctual creatures. We naturally have our instincts... To fear, to fear things that are dangerous to us most of the time. And there are some people who are more fearful of some things. Like me, I'm more fearful of spiders. You're more okay with spiders. Uh, you're more okay with snakes. I'm not okay with snakes. Me, I can sit... Like, I respect snakes highly. Like, if I see yeah. a snake, I'm not getting close to it until I know what it is. And if I get close to it, I'm still probably not picking the damn thing up with my hands. You know? Like if, uh, even if I know that's probably not a venomous snake. Well, and if I ever come across a venomous snake, I'm going to give it a wide berth. Because, yes. Well, you know, I respect them, but I am going to stand there and gawk at it because I'm going to be like, dude, I love snakes. I want to see a snake. I would I'm say this. Be like, well, ah! like I would say this do. about snakes. I, like Bill Burr had a great bit about about like. If you got snake bit, wouldn't you have some questions? How did it happen? Were you, it's like, were you being stupid? Were you fucking with it? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, it, it's like, did it, did it look poisonous? Do you think you're going to die? Are you lightheaded right now? It's like, it, I, I love that. I love that kind of stuff. But I wouldn't fuck with snakes to save my life. I, I came across a black snake when I was a kid. Uh, when I was down at the riverbank uh, with my cousins, they all left to go get some uh, some stuff. To uh, bit. we were building like an amateur dam in the river or in the little creek behind uh, our aunt's house, and they went off to get some like wood or some tarps or something like that. And they come back and they find me just like like up on the side of the riverbank, just like just like like just like not getting anywhere near it. And I told them it's because there's a black snake down there. And they go down there, and it was a snake that was about mm, yay big around and about five feet long. I'm not sure. We weren't sure exactly what it was, but we're, we're pretty sure it was just like a regular mountain black snake. Nothing too, nothing poisonous or anything like that. Yeah, it, it's always <clears> good to be cautious because, I mean, like a snake uh, yeah. that close to water that's darker in color could be a cottonmouth. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest... Like, the more you come to understand things about those kind of animals, the less scary they really become. Because true, the more you learn, the more you realize there's a lot of myth behind things. Like, cottonmouths don't fucking chase people. Like, no, they usually run away. Yeah, if it, like people have said they oh they swam right at me and stuff, you know, and it's like literally like they end up getting caught in a current, and you're probably caught in the same current. More than likely. And it's not that it's coming straight at you. It's just it's, it's going trying with the flow not of the to, river. Yeah, it's, it's trying not to swim against the current and drown itself. And you're just kind of fucking there. 
And for the most part, most likely, if you were to just, like, dip your head under and just let it fucking go over you, it probably would without bothering you. But, I mean, this guy literally had a video. He was like, oh, yeah, cotton mouths, so aggressive, so mean, you know. And he fucking put his boot in the thing's mouth and was like, yeah, it wants to fuck me up so bad, right? And it wouldn't even bite down on his boot. He literally just sat there being like, leave me alone, dickhead. <laughs> like, He's just like... Yeah. But then, you know, sharks, I'm just like, dude, that's the most terrifying animal to me, and I don't even live where they live. It, well, I mean, super fast in the water. Like, h- how many rows of teeth? Like, three rows of teeth? And their teeth grow back whenever one's broken out. And they also fight off, like, they they fight off cancer naturally. Like, cancer... Like, cancer is not a problem for sharks. They're able I mean, that's to... That's not even one of the things that creeps me out about them. I'm just like, that's fine. Like, more power Well, no, dude. Them. In yeah. terms of their evolutionary pattern and too. how they evolved to do that, the fact that their body will literally encircle where the cancer is and just, like, form a callus and it won't grow anymore. It's like, holy shit. That's insane. And then, of course, they can smell blood in the water from miles and miles away, which is a real thing, by the way. So people are like, that's not real. No, it is real. Marine biologists have confirmed it. Like, bl- like blood in the water, they know it's coming. They're, they know where it's at. But <clears throat> anyway, we have here a video from Mr. Ball in Top 3 Photos with Disturbing Backstories, Part 3. Let's uh, go ahead and just hop on in. What you got for us, John? Today, I'm going to show I think I got so distracted by that conversation about fear, I never actually got back to the point I was originally trying to make. What time. was it? <laughs> it's basically these pictures just play off of the way that people's fears differ. Like, some of these might be really terrifying to one person, not so much to someone else, you know? This is true. Yeah. You three progressively more disturbing stories, and at the end of each of them, I'm going to share with you a picture that is famously associated with them. But before I get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do, and I upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, then please throat punch the like button and then subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. Throat punch. Right, let's get into today's stories. <coughs> throat punch the like button. Throat. I was like, the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> I throat punched I was like, myself. Are you okay? <laughs> it's like, hold on, let me throat punch the like button and uh, <coughs> I, was, I was spacing out, so I was like, oh shit, is Nate dying? What's happening? No. Now if I were dying, you you probably wouldn't know it because I'd probably just be over here just like <laughs> Yeah, it's probably what it'd be like. I'd probably just like have a sudden heart attack and my heart would explode in my chest. You probably just see something like a like a, <laughs> and then I just like I'd, that would be fucked up. And then all of a sudden, just like a kilo. It's almost like that fucking guy like from the Futurama. Monty Python thing. Like you know, it's like something like the animator, something like a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> another one for, for me. It, it remind what I was d- discussing it reminds me of the death of Helmut Spargel from uh, like Bender's cooking coach. In Futurama, I don't uh, he was just like he's like Bender. You made me a passable meal, but unfortunately, my stomach is about to explode. <laughs> and then he's like, "Helmet, I'm so sorry." He's like, "It's okay, Bender. I taught you everything I know, and hopefully, it will lead to your success." And then you just see his stomach just go. <laughs> <laughs> Futurama has just so many great little things. And yes, it's funnier than The Simpsons, especially modern Simpsons. Simpsons seasons two through six, two, like two through eight, I would say were were just as funny as Futurama. But yeah, anyway, sorry. Offended. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, a Twitter biopic in you know in one word. Offended. 
Between 1974 and 1975, a criminal who had been dubbed the Visayala Ransacker had been terrorizing the Eastern District of Sacramento, California. Initially, he would break into people's homes when they were sleeping by prying open one of their windows. He would go inside and basically ransack their house. He wouldn't steal any of the major valuables that were right in plain sight. He would just kind of throw things all over the place and would take one or two small things, probably as a souvenir. Unfortunately, by the summer of 1976, this Visayala ransacker was not only not caught, but was also no longer satisfied with just breaking into people's homes and ransacking them and taking a few things. He had moved on to killing people, and so he had been given a new nickname, one that just about everybody knew at the time, and that was the Golden State Killer. Once he began Remember killing people, one? he became much more cautious about how he would actually go about attacking them. He would oftentimes break into his victims' homes while they weren't there, and he would walk their property, look for guns and unload them. He would look for any security cameras or devices and turn mm. them off. He would plant ligatures, pieces of rope and twine that he could use to bind people's arms and legs. He would place them in their house, and then he would leave. And he would study his victims and get to know their patterns and know when they were going to be in the house, when they were going to be in certain rooms. Rooms, and then at some point he would sneak in through a window at night while they were sleeping and their victims would wake up with him standing over them with a flashlight in their face. On the rare occasion where neighbors or police had actually spotted this guy, they saw that he was wearing a full face mask and he was very athletic. He was able to elude police capture and would jump over fences and would run away. By the end of 1976, when the Golden State Killer had still not been caught, citizens of Sacramento became furious with the police. They felt like they were not doing enough to try to catch this guy. So on November 3rd, 1976, the police actually host this huge town hall meeting and they invite all the citizens of Sacramento to come be a part of it, voice your complaints, listen to what police are actually trying to do to catch the Golden State Killer, and basically just have an opportunity to air your grievances a little bit. Mm -hmm. During the meeting, a well, that's basically the police going, "Oh, y'all think you have better ideas than what we got? Well, let's hear it, dumb fucks." Go for it. Go for it. Who was a citizen of Sacramento stands up and basically starts making fun of the Golden State Killer, calling him weak and a coward, saying, you know, you're preying on women. If you ever came to my house, I would totally beat the crap out of you. Like, this guy's a joke. And everybody in the town hall meeting just totally ate it up. It was like this one little victory for the town of Sacramento is we're going to put down the Golden State Killer for being weak and a coward. Then, in an ironic twist of fate, that guy who was making fun of the Golden State Killer, he and his wife became the next victims <laughs> of the uh, Golden State talking Killer. Mad shit. And in fact, the Golden State Killer changed his entire M.O. Instead I would say that wasn't running, ironic. I would say whoever the killer was was at that fucking town hall that's meeting. That's what I'm... Oh, I bet you they're going to show a picture of the town hall like, meeting. He's probably sitting there like, oh, you just wait till tonight. I yeah, it just, I guarantee you they're going to show a picture of the town hall meeting. Everyone's going to be like, like smiling and up in arms. And then you're just going to see this one random guy off in the corner just like looking at the fucker who said all that shit. And he's just like, tonight, motherfucker. Tonight's the night random people all over Sacramento, he began only targeting married couples, and he would always attack when the husband was home. For decades, the Golden State Killer eluded capture and even taunted the police in threatening phone calls all the way up until 2001. But in 2016, Jeez. they reinvestigated the Golden State Killer case using DNA evidence, something that was not available in the 70s and the 80s when they were investigating these crimes. And it was through this reinvestigation that they were able to capture 74-year-old Joseph D'Angelo in 2018, who was, in fact, the Golden State Killer. D'Angelo pled guilty to 13 counts of first-degree murder and was given 12 consecutive life sentences. When the killer was finally identified as Joseph D'Angelo, police were going through some of the older case photos and they made a startling discovery. This is a picture from the November 3rd, 1976 town hall meeting. You were and correct. there in the middle of the photo is none other than Joseph D'Angelo, AKA the Golden State Killer. And he was there when that citizen of Sacramento stood up and began berating the Golden State Killer, saying how he was a coward and weak and that he would totally beat him up if he ever came to his house. And there's Joseph D'Angelo sitting there listening to this guy. And after the meeting, what does he do? He targets the guy that spoke out against him. And even after he attacked this guy, apparently he was so upset that he changed his entire M.O. and only targeted married couples from that point on, as if he was proving a point that you can't touch me. Damn. Mm. That level of overpreparedness for a killer of that nature is is terrifying yeah it's scary
And the fact that they didn't catch him until 2016, was it? Sheesh. <clears throat> That's why you should always double prepare or have a secret weapon. Oh, yeah. I mean, one that... Like, that's why I don't tell people where my guns are. That's why I have my weapons, and I'm and honestly, I'm not gonna let it. Like, I'm not. I don't want to become a victim. Tyler Hadley turned 15. He was skipping school regularly and hanging out with the wrong crowd. Tyler's parents had tried to do everything to get their son back on track between doctor's visits, psychiatry appointments, medication, and outpatient mental health program, but none of it seemed to work. Tyler right, just was on the wrong teeth. path. As Tyler's behavior continued to get worse as he got older, his parents just didn't know what to do, became very frustrated with him, and became very, very strict disciplinarians. One night when Tyler came home and he appeared to be intoxicated his parents took his phone and car away and Tyler was furious and he confided in his best friend Michael Mandel that he thought his parents had gone over the line that they were over disciplining him and he said to Michael that he wanted to kill his mother now Michael knew Tyler and had known him since he was a little kid and he did not think twice about this claim that you know Tyler wanted to kill his mom he just thought that Tyler was frustrated with his parents and Michael did know that Tyler's parents were very, very strict and hard on him. So he just kind of wrote it off. Not long after this incident, Tyler starts talking about this huge house party he's gonna have. And all of Tyler's friends, including Michael, just didn't buy it. They're like, there's no way you could ever pull this off. Your parents are too strict and they never leave town anyways. But every time people approached him, he would say, oh no, my parents aren't gonna be there. They'll never find out. At some point, Michael gets a Facebook invitation to Tyler's big house party and he sees that it's been sent to so oh, many people. Friend. It's been sent yeah. well beyond an inner circle of friends to just total strangers. And then on the Facebook invitation itself, someone had posted on the wall, hey, Tyler, what are you going to do if your parents come home? And he responded to that, they won't. Trust me. On the day of the party, Michael shows up to Tyler's house and it is packed with people. Lots of people he didn't know and he was fairly certain Tyler didn't know them either. Damn. And he goes inside and it's clear that no one gives a crap about the house itself. People are writing on the walls, people have spilled stuff all over the ground, there's broken glass on Jesus. the ground, people are rummaging through the food in the fridge, no one cared about the house. And Tyler, oddly enough, didn't seem to mind at all. The only time Tyler became on edge was when he felt like the party was getting too loud. And he would go around and tell people to be quiet because he didn't want his neighbors to hear because the neighbors would call the police and he didn't want the police coming to the house. During this big party, Tyler pulls Michael aside and says, hey, I gotta tell you something, come outside with me. When they get outside, Tyler looks at Mike and just says, Mike, I killed my parents. Michael doesn't believe him, but Tyler says, no, look in my driveway. Their car is still here. They did not go to Orlando. I killed my parents. Michael still didn't Jesus believe Christ. him, and Tyler said, go inside. I bet if you look around, you'll find blood in my house. So he goes inside, and he starts looking around, and when he goes upstairs, he sees there's blood on a table right outside the master bedroom where Tyler's parents slept. And on the door handle to the master bedroom, there was also blood. So he goes back down, Jeez. and he goes, Tyler, you're playing a prank on me. And Tyler goes, no, when the party dies down, I'll show you proof. At this point, Michael is starting to think this could actually be real. And Tyler walks away and Michael's thinking to himself, I, I can't wait till the end of this party to see if this is really true or not. So he goes upstairs, goes to the bloody door handle to the master bedroom, opens it up, and the door actually hits the leg of Tyler's father who's laying on the ground who's deceased inside of the master bedroom. He shuts the door and he's standing in the hall and he doesn't know what to do because on the one hand, Tyler's his friend, but he just discovered Tyler's a murderer. At this point, you're not my friend anymore. Nope. If you have committed a violent act that has resulted in the deaths of two innocent people, you're not my friend anymore. I'm sorry. Friendship goes far with me. If you're my friend, you're my friend for life, but if you do something like this, I want nothing to do with you, and not only will I turn you in, I will beat the shit out of you, and then I will turn you in, because it is what you deserve. He also knew Tyler's parents really well, so he's deeply saddened by what he just saw. And as he's standing there, he's realizing that he has to turn Tyler in. And so for some reason, he just felt the need to take one more picture with Tyler because he knew as soon as he left the house, oh he was going to go tell authorities what Tyler had done, and he was never going to see him again. 
And so he goes over to Tyler and he takes this picture. After Tyler was arrested, he admitted that just hours before this house party, he had bludgeoned his parents to death and stashed them in the master bedroom. Tyler was sentenced to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. And while he has been remorseful, he's never given a real reason why he actually killed his parents. Jeez. Damn, dude. My parents were strict on me for, for a long time in my life, and I... I I gotta say, I mean, like it it sucked, but I would never result I would never resort to to violence against them. I would try and do better. I I, I don't get it. But if you just go back and look at the dude though, he just looks like a dude that would kill his parents. Hmm. Uh, I see it. It's got that kind of like fucking ghoul shaped face going on, I don't know. Yeah. Had bludgeoned his parents reason on the morning of tuesday april 20th 1999 a colorado high school student named brooks brown noted something strange his on again off again friend named eric had missed all of the oh i know what morning, this is gonna be is totally uncharacteristic of eric who was a straight a student oh. at lunchtime brown left the high school to go to the designated smoking area in the parking lot and he saw parked in a very far away spot somewhere that he never saw him parked before was his friend eric who was in the back of his car pulling a large duffel bag out of the trunk. Brown puts a cigarette out and walks over and asks Eric, where have you been all morning? And Eric turns to Brown and goes, it doesn't matter. I'd like you, so you should leave right now. Go home. Uh, Brown was taken. I know, I know this, where this is going to go. Mm -hmm. Taken back I know, by his I know what and the general weirdness of the morning. Colorado, Pretty sure I've heard this as well. Colorado, Eric, and his friend Dylan. Mm-hmm. Columbine. Eric was always kind of a wild card. He was a guy that had in the past <clears throat> vandalized Brown's house. He had posted death threats online about Brown. And then simultaneously, he would brag to Brown all the time about different accomplishments, like he desperately wanted approval from Brown. So it was a very strange relationship they had. Brown doesn't really know what to make of this, and so he kind of just shrugs his shoulders, turns around and walks away, while Eric turns around and continues doing whatever he's doing with his duffel bag. Brown gets back over to the smoking area, and he's thinking, you know, maybe I should just skip class and go home, because maybe Eric has some prank that he's got planned that he's protecting me from. And as he's sitting there, smoking smoking his cigarette, thinking about whether or not he's going to stay or go. He hears noises coming from the also, high school. Also, holy shit, they had smoking areas in high school back then? Yeah. What the fuck? Mm-hmm. You were instantly expelled our... if you brought a cigarette anywhere near a school. Anywhere yeah, 50 yards near a school, school, you're basically expelled. Fireworks. And so in his mind, he's like, oh, looks like he was planning a senior prank. He's lighting fireworks inside of the school. But then the sounds got faster and louder, and he turned to look at the school, and he heard people screaming, and he knew those... That movie uh, that they're using right there for uh, reference on it, um, it's fucked, dude. Elephant, it is a... Dude, holy shit. The, the last 20 minutes of that film, like, just rip your fucking heart out. Those weren't fireworks. Those were gunshots. Brown immediately runs to the nearest house, knocks on their door, and is able to get a phone, and he calls police. After Eric had spoken to Brown, when Brown came across the lot and asked him what he was doing, and then ultimately Brown turned around and walked back to the smoke pit, Eric had turned his attention to his duffel bag. He had pulled it out and dragged it across the lot to another car where one of his other friends named Dylan was also yeah. getting his own duffel bag out uh. of the back of his own car. Inside of their duffel bags were propane tank time bombs that they planned to place all around the school in an effort to collapse the ceiling of the cafeteria because what they wanted to do is get people to start running out of the school so they could start shooting at them. Eric and Dylan's car were parked far away from their usual spots, kind of strategically located near where first responders were bound to come in, and they had rigged their cars to explode so that when they did come through, they would detonate and hopefully take out the first responders as well. Eric and Dylan had also placed placed another timed explosive on a field about three miles away that was purely a diversion. They were hoping it would go off. It would get police and first responders over there first, giving them more time to inflict max damage on the school. But with the exception of the diversionary bomb that did go off, none of the other explosives in the high school actually
actually went off. So Dylan and Eric had to go to plan B, which is to walk right in the school and just start shooting. At the end of the day, 12 students from Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado had been killed, along with one of their teachers, as well as Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, the two shooters. At the time, this was far and away the deadliest American school shooting. This senior class picture was taken two weeks before the Columbine shooting, and you can clearly see Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold pointing finger guns at the camera. Along with a few others. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. At the time this picture was taken, they both knew what they were going to do to the students in that picture because they had been planning this attack for over a year and referred to it as Judgment Day. So that's going to do it, guys. Give me your reactions to these three stories in the William comment Harris. section, and I will yeah, pin the best comment at the top. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please throat punch the like button and subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. You can direct message me on Instagram and Twitter. My username is johnballin416 on both platforms. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok. My username is Mr. Ballin over there. We have a subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. That's where you should put your story suggestions. If I intentionally use one, I will credit you. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya. You know, that situation um, is basically the, the one situation. Like, I don't know there's other people that get inspired by, like, uh, researching serial killers and stuff. But that's the one situation that actually made me slightly consider getting into psychology. Just because my brain has never been able to process at all how someone can go from A to Z on getting into, like, the idea of what those two fuckers did. Yeah. And it's just, like, I that's the only thing, like, that's ever made me kind of consider, like, going into, like, criminal psychology. Just so I can maybe get an idea of, like, fucking how. Like, how did you come to the conclusion that that was Should the that... answer to whatever was going on? like in your guys lives like what the fuck you know yeah this is this is this is the movie this and this guy right here this is based on why Brown. is it called elephant i'm not i don't know you know, the guy that directed the film gus van zant he's very quirky with his uh way of doing things but yeah he uh right here this kid, the blonde-haired kid, is based on Brown, the guy in the video. Because uh, they walk by him and they say, Hey, guys, where are you going? Don't go back inside the school. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah, so right here, he's just like, Oh, shit. And he starts warning people. And over the next 12 minutes, it just devolves into absolute chaos and they follow almost exactly how they did it in the in the original like layout of how Claybold and Harris did what they did yeah it it gets bad I remember yeah, the uh, first American Horror Story season has a uh, scene that's heavily inspired by the way they did that shit. Yeah. It's uh, basically they have a character that it's pretty much like, it's not two people, but it's one character that's basically supposed to be pretty much, you know, the combination of them. An amalgamation of both characters, of both yeah. guys, yeah. And, like, he goes into the library while people are hiding under desks and stuff, and it's just, like, hunting people down and finding them and shooting them without... I remember, I remember wars. that. I remember that, yeah. And there's one guy that, like, tries to stop him, and he's like, hey, that's enough. And, like, obviously he just turns around and shoots him in the face. Mm -hmm. God. <sighs> it's a pretty disturbing scene. I remember that film, and then another one... It was less popular, but in some ways, I think it it actually like it did a more realistic depiction because of um, because of like how it was filmed. It's called Zero Day. That one that one's actually readily available on YouTube, and it's to be honest, like I I get like 
to an extent why people would want to like make recreations of that but also to an extent i think it's just i don't really 100 percent agree with actually doing that like i think that it's giving too much credit to like those two assholes to actually recreate what they did know what i mean yes but to an extent but for me it's like it, like i can see it from both sides because i can see it from the side of like if you forget history then you're doomed to repeat it so it's like people should never forget that this was allowed to happen but from another side like i'm just kind of like i don't feel like anyone who does shit like this even all the serial killer documentaries and stuff i'm kind of like i almost feel like these kind of people don't deserve to be put on film being acted by someone else know what i mean true true uh, god anyway we need to get on and move on from this yeah. this was mr ballin uh disturbing photos need to get on to something lighter <laughs> yeah three disturbing photos that was, uh, with uh, backstories works. with disturbing backstories Part three by Mr. Ballin. If you want to see more from Mr. Ballin, y'all know the y'all know the drill. Yeah, and until next that time, was dark stuff. Yeah, until next time, I'm Nate. I'm Nick. See you later, everybody. Peace.